Here is another topic from linear algebra that finds a much better expression in tensor terms. So in linear algebra, you know the following trick for decomposing a vector with respect to an orth orthogonal basis by evaluating inner products. So suppose we have a basis that consists of three orthogonal vectors, E1, E2, E3. And I'm not writing arrows over these E's because I want to work in a general linear space with a general inner product. And if you have another vector V, that's a linear combination of these basis vectors. In other words, has the decomposition alpha 1, E1, plus alpha 2, E2, plus alpha 3, E3. And we will use this as our symbol for the inner product. This is the inner product between U and V. Here is how you could determine each one of these coefficients individually only by evaluating inner product and performing other basic arithmetic operations. The idea is to dot both sides of this identity with E1. So decomposition. Decomposition is the procedure for obtaining the coefficients of representing a linear vector by a linear, excuse me, representing a vector by a linear combination with respect to a basis. So our goal is to determine these coefficients. And it is done by evaluating inner products as follows. We will dot both sides with E1. The order doesn't matter because the inner product is symmetric. And you can think of this being the dot product in geometric vectors. So here's the inner product. Once I expand it, I will have E2, E1 dotting E1, and E2 dotting E1, which is zero because I'm stating that the basis is orthogonal, and E3 dotted with E1, which is zero because the basis is orthogonal. But let me write them anyway. So that, so that I can have the pleasure of crossing them out. Plus alpha 2, E2, dotted with E1, plus alpha 3, E3, dotted with E1. And this is 0 because the basis is orthogonal. This is 0 because the basis is orthogonal. There's a single surviving term which tells us that alpha 1 equals V dotted with E1 divided by E1 dotted with E1. Beautiful. This sometimes I even use as motivation for generalizing the inner product from geometric space to arbitrary linear spaces. Now let's take this formula in two different directions. Let's first consider an even more special basis. Let's consider an orthonormal basis where these vectors are not only orthogonal, but unit length. And then we'll ask ourselves, well, what would happen if the basis is not orthogonal at all, but a random basis? Can this technique still work? So first, if the basis is orthonormal, how does this formula simplify? Yeah. Denominator is 1. Denominator is 1. So we're just left with alpha 1, and now I can even write alpha i, because of course it works for or any i, and here's this beautiful formula. So when the basis is orthonormal, and I'm trying to stick to one side of the board, and then the same, we'll do the same thing in tensor terms, with beautiful results on this board, and we'll have the contrast. Okay, so the rule works, the rule states that if you want to find the coefficient of a vector with respect to an orthonormal basis, just dot the vector with the corresponding vector. Very nice formula. Couldn't be any nicer. If the basis is merely orthogonal, you have to divide by the length squared of the basis element. That's good. And what if the basis is not orthogonal at all, but an arbitrary basis, geometrically thinking a basis that looks like this? Does this method fail? And the answer is... Not really, so the simplicity of these equations will no longer be there. 
but you what you will do is you'll evaluate all three inner products you will evaluate all three inner products and that will actually give you three equations and three unknowns so I have no choice but to steal a little bit of space from this board and actually write down so you'll end up with this system that's just not diagonal and if you have a reliable fast way of solving linear equations with symmetric positive definite matrices then maybe it's not so much worse but this matrix will consist of E1 so let's just see what the first equation will be E1 dotted with E1 E1, so I'll switch it, E1 dotted with E2 right. and E1 dotted with E3 E1 dotted with E3 and then of course E and I'll just finish writing the first system alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 equals V dotted with E1 Okay, that's cool. And the second equation that would come from dotting the original identity with E2 on both sides would look like this. E2, E1, E2, E2, all numbers. E2, E3 equals V dotted with E3. That would be the second equation. Might as well write the third equation down. E3 dotted, oops with E1, E3 dotted with E2, and E3 dotted with E3 equals V dotted with E3. This was E2, I thought. So the effectiveness of the method of decomposition by inner product is lost. But, it would, but the idea that you can find the three coefficients by only evaluating inner products, you see I have nine inner products written here, and then solving this three by three system, which is arithmetic, you can still recover alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. So that's the linear algebra inspiration to what I'm about to show you. Here we go. Suppose we now have, now we're back in the geometric space. So in the geometric space, we would write this, and we have our covariant and contravariant basis, so we would write this, V equals VI ZI, and our challenge is to find VI. The logic is the same, let's dot both sides with all possible basis elements, except here's what I'm going to do. I will dot both sides with a contravariant basis on both sides. Let's dot both sides with ZJ. Let's dot both sides with ZJ. It will be become immediately obvious while I'm doing this. And just tell me what ZI dotted with ZJ is. Chronic or delta? Delta Ji. So what does this expression become? Vj. Vj. Hmm. Exactly what we're looking for. An expression for the contravariant component of the vector. That's kind of amazing. Let me just write it here and box it. Vi equals V vector dotted with Zj. How's that possible? So simple. So if you want to get the contravariant component of a vector with respect to the covariant basis, just dot it with the contravariant basis element, corresponding contravariant basis element. It has the simplicity of this. And this works even if the basis is not orth, orth so it has the simplicity in form of an expression that only works for an orthonormal basis. But this doesn't even have to be an orthogonal basis. It's an arbitrary basis. So for a moment, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. 
but it just seems magical that the rule, so the rule for the orthonormal basis in linear algebra was if you want to recover the coefficient of a decomposition, just dot it with the corresponding basis element. That works only if the basis is orthonormal. If it's not, you have to do this. In tensor notation, there's no calculus here. We're just, you know, the triplet is, of vectors could be the sort of thing we start with. And then from that we built the metric tensor, inverted, form the contravariant set of vectors, and then the rule just becomes, if you want the contravariant coefficient, just stop the vector with a contravariant basis element, and you've got your coefficient. Sorry. I'm very disappointed in myself for having a chicken egg. I was just renaming the index. All right, everything I said, but now about this equation. Uh, all right. Does that seem like magic? Yes. In the linear algebra notation, yes. could you use um, the dual space basis to make that calculation shorter? Yes. It's the same sort of thing. But where is the, where is the magic? So is it really magical? Is it really... Does the notation make it shorter? A shorter calculation? So how come, in this case, we would have to invert this matrix of pairwise inner dot products? And what about in this notation? Same thing. Exactly right. Because this is really just the metric tensor. Do you guys recognize that? The metric tensor is pairwise in a product. No surprise whatsoever that the, that the metric tensor appears by itself. So here it is. It makes an appearance. And to do this calculation, you have to do this inversion. Well, there's the same inversion of the metric tensor in here. It's just that it's absorbed in the placement of the index. So this placement of the index, the fact that we're dealing with the contravariant basis means that we've already inverted the metric tensor and did the multiplication, which would be the multiplication that happens on the right-hand side. So all of it is the same. The calculations encoded in this expression are the same as in linear algebra. It's just that ex the expression is so much more appealing than having to deal with, well, what do you prefer, this or this? They say the same thing. The first? Still? No. Oh, this was the first. All right. <laughs> You're just trying to make me feel good. That's right. Of course. Okay. So, but just remember this rule. We're going to use this, if you can call it a rule, all the time for the rest of the class. Not today's lecture, but your lives. For the rest of your lives. If you need the component of a vector, just dot it with the corresponding contravariant basis. Contravariant basis element. That's all. Very powerful, very compact, and very beautiful. Okay?